Okay, we're now recording. Great. Well, thank you very much, Gillian, for making time to speak to us here at The Mint magazine. Well, I'm delighted to be part of the conversation and thrilled that The Mint magazine is so interested. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, can I start? Can you just give us a very short, potted version of what AnthroVision is? Well, AnthroVision is basically about bringing some of the lessons from cultural anthropology into looking at the world. And what you can do that usefully, whether you work in economics, finance, business, um, politics, law, medicine, tech. And a lot of people might say, well, that's kind of weird, because actually, I thought anthropology was all about sort of, you know, weird rituals and exotic peoples and, you know, versions of Indiana Jones and stuff. That's got nothing to do with my life now. And what I try and tell people is that it absolutely has things to do with your life right now, because although anthropology used to be about studying people who's looked exotic, often in a very patronizing and racist way, today it's completely different. It's about studying what it means to be human in a digital age and recognizing that culture matters, even or especially if you live your life with computers. And culture is not a box or a single thing set in stone. It's a spectrum. It's a river that's constantly changing and moving, which can't be defined easily. But if we ignore it, then we suffer. So it's sort of seeing culture in a sense or seeing connections and social structures it's seeing cultural systems as a whole and recognizing that nothing we do is ever in isolation from everything else and that we have to look at the wider ecosystem and the cultural system to make sense of our world and that sounds very vague but let me give you an example if you are creating an economics model to see where the economy is going that will be defined just by what you put into the model which historically has been things like inflation and growth and GDP and things like that. But if you ignore completely things outside that model, like climate change, then that can have a very nasty habit of suddenly coming and tripping up the model. So you need to have wider vision. You need to move from tunnel vision to lateral vision. Or to take another example, if you're trying to draw a model of, say, financial markets or how a new product might, might work or not work, if you just look at it in terms of, say, financial flows and the you know cost of money, cost of capital, investments, etc., you know you have something very useful. But if you ignore the incentive structure of the bankers who are creating those products, you will fail to see how seemingly good ideas in finance can spin out of control and turn bad. We saw that in 2008. So in essence, what I'm arguing is that. The 20th century produced lots of amazing intellectual tools like balance sheets, like economic models, like big data sets. We need to recognize and appreciate those and use them, but we need to put them in context because otherwise we're like somebody who's walking through a dark wood at night with a compass. You don't want to throw your compass away. It's useful. But if you just look down at the dial of your compass and never look up, you're going to end up walking into a tree or tripping over a tree root. And that's what we've seen happen, you know, in the world of economics and finance and so many business spheres in recent years. When I, reading your book, the, the big message I got was that, yes, this vision idea that opening your mind, empathizing, observing these sorts of elements were, were absolutely central. I wondered, though, whether theory because we sort of expect you know an economics theory is central but a lot of other places and i just wonder about the balance between this sort of open mindset and observation skills and being there and noticing how that relates to theory and what role theory plays in that well you ask a really great question henry and there's really sort of two components or three components of anthropology one is a method of observation, and anthropology is partly just defined by, by what people call ethnography, which basically means using your eyes and your you know, and your smell and your you know you know your listening ears and all the rest of it to try and see what's happening. And what anthropologists do is instead of trying to understand situations top down or as isolated subject topics. So, if say you're studying religion as an economist or a sociologist, you look at all the churches, all the religious groups in England, perhaps, and try and get a macro picture, but look at religion as a religious thing in itself. 
what an anthropologist does is go and sit inside a church and just observe over a long period of time and see what actual congregations and parishioners are doing and talk to everybody, not just the people who seem important in relation to religion. You know, talk to the lollipop lady outside the church door who's steering the traffic or the local shop, you know, all the aspects of life and just absorb the rituals and the everyday practices, you know, walk in other people's shoes. Because an anthropologist would argue that so much of our experience and our sense of the world comes not through our minds and our brains or our computer spreadsheets, but in our embodied practice, what we do every day, you know, all five senses matter. That means by necessity, anthropology tends to be small scale and they extrapolate from small scale examples upwards. But it's a different way of looking at the world. It's a, it's a worm's eye view, not a bird's eye view. And again, I'm not saying that either is correct or has all the answers, but they can be very complementary and very powerful. So that's ethnography. And then in addition to that, there's a whole body of theory in anthropology about the role of rituals and the role of exchanges. One of the ideas that defines anthropology is that societies are glued together through exchanges, which don't necessarily need to be just about money. And there's lots of other exchanges too that matter, but which economists and financiers tend to ignore. Um, there's theories in anthropology about identity and cultural boundaries and pollution and things like that. And all of that can be very, very useful. As well. But, you know, I think if anyone's thinking, oh, gosh, this weird thing, anthropology, how does it relate to my life? You know, don't jump in headfirst trying to embrace all the theory of anthropology necessarily. But do try and look at some of the methodologies that anthropologists use to understand situations, because, frankly, they can be used anywhere. And the third point I'd mention is also the fundamental philosophy behind anthropology, which is perhaps the most potent of all, which is this. It pays to embrace a bit of culture shock. It pays to embrace a bit of culture shock. You know, most humans hate culture shock. We're hardwired to go, ooh, they're kind of weird and strange. You know, when Donald Trump said that places in Africa were, quote, shitholes, his words, not mine, for anyone who's offended, you know, everyone, everyone who's so decent and educated and things went, oh, that's a horrible thing to say. But the dirty secret is we all have that instinct inside of ourselves to kind of, you know, shy away from things that seem different. Anthropology argues we need to do the opposite, embrace a bit of difference for two reasons. One, trying to think yourself into the mind of people who seem different from you gives you empathy for how other people think, which is crucial to survive in a complex, globalized and also polarized world. Second, it enables you to flip the lens and look back at yourself much more clearly and see the things that you're ignoring. Because there's a great Chinese proverb that a fish can't see water, but it can if a fish jumps out of its own fishbowl and goes and looks at other fishbowls and then looks back. And that's really the fundamental philosophy of anthropology. I, I mean, I totally sort of relate to this, I suppose, as I feel very much I come from a tribe that I've sort of left and I can sort of... Um, observe it and see the strange rituals and so forth. One of the things that you talked about, which I really liked, was the idea of looking for the silences, mm. which I think was a brilliant idea. And the fact, obviously, that has worked really well for you in terms of spotting things people weren't talking about. But I thought I'd turn it back on you. <laughs> and one thing about the book, I thought, was there were, there were two silences. One, I'll start with one, which not quite silences, but the, the issue of power. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. uh, in that, obviously, there were comments like you made there, look at what the less powerful people are doing, relate to them, understand them. But I suppose, to me, I was expecting, if you're looking at different tribes, one of the key things is the, the power imbalance between tribes. And, and the fact that, of course, if you're lower status, you probably spend a lot time, a lot more time attending to the higher status people and what they do and their customs, etc., and observing them because your livelihood depends on them. Whereas if you're in the top tribe, you can just dominate and do what you like to some extent. But I, I felt in the book you didn't really address the, the power issue head on. Was am I right? Yeah, no, you're quite right there. You're quite right there. And the hell of writing a book is you write a book, you do your best job, you end up panicking in the last month or two because you're under deadline pressure. You send it off and then of course you realize all the things you missed and could have done better. And you have that even more intensively when you come to actually talk to people like yourself, Henry, about what could and should have been in the you know, I, I often wish I wish I could write my book now after going on book tour because now I really understand what I'm trying to say and all the things I missed. 
So you actually have a very fair, fair point there, Henry. And I should have talked more openly about the power structure. And that plays out in all kinds of ways. I mean, you know, I do address it a bit with Donald Trump and journalists and the fact that one of the reasons why journalists were so blind to the rise of Donald Trump was because we've absorbed assumptions that essentially assume that anyone who has the control of language has power and credibility yeah. and they're blind and that we tend to discount people who don't have command of words. Um, and that's very easy for journalists to do because they get paid to control and command words. That's what their job is. You know, and of course, every elite has a creation myth, which kind of justifies their elite. And so many journalists, you know, laughed when Donald Trump used the word bigly as a sign that he simply wasn't fit for office. Yeah. And they to see that their own relatively high position within the power structure meant they were ignoring the views of other groups who weren't journalists, who actually thought, you know what, we're really irritated that those journalists and other people assume that language gives them power and we like the idea that somebody talks like us and you know it yeah. indicates equalizing yeah. but you're quite right i couldn't should have brought that out much more clearly the same pattern's true of finance where essentially financiers were in control of a not just language around things like credit derivatives and financial innovation but the technology that no one else understood and that gave them power too but it also made them blind i equate that to financial latin in the medieval catholic church that you know people spoke jargon no one else understood but it costs them too. And I like that the, the chapter on the um, digital world and the fact that, of course, all the techie stuff, although it's open, anyone can turn up, but no one can understand it. Um, Absolutely. I mean, I tell the story about, you know, the people, the geeks that create the Internet. I've actually been since told off for using the word geek because that is sounds pejorative. And that, again, reflects my biases and prejudices. So we're all on journeys, journeys of yeah. discovery in a way. But no, the geek, the, sorry, the people who create the Internet, the engineers with yeah. whom I enormous or for whom I have enormous respect, they, even they recognize the power of nonverbal communication because they hum to make decisions. I thought that was a great example. Absolutely fascinating. It's in the book, I should explain for people who haven't read the book, that basically there's this group called the IETF, which creates the architecture of much of the internet. And they've decided that when they have to decide collectively on how to de design bits of the internet, the architecture, and these are incredibly important decisions about things like how to stop um, cyber hacking of utilities and stuff like that. You know, you'd think that these are some of the most computer savvy, intellectually sophisticated, smart engineers on the planet. They must want to use computers to make these decisions and, and essentially take votes. And they don't. They physically get together in a room and they collectively hum like they're in a Tibetan chant to indicate whether they you know, like or don't like an idea. And the loudest hum wins. And it's deliberately sort of subjective and qualitative and fuzzy in the way they make these decisions. But they like it because they know that our lived experience matters. I think, no, I thought that was a lovely example and really interesting how, you know, as you spot in so many areas, these rituals and I, that create identity, you know, are so crucial. One thing I was interested in, another silence, I thought, <clears throat> um, was the question of functional versus dysfunctional cultures and that is always tricky because of course we think we might think our tribe is best and knows best and I certainly you know I can see that my tribe definitely thought they were morally superior to everyone else and so there is a, a sense that you know you look at another tribe and they're strange and dysfunctional and do weird things but I wonder you know whether there is anything in anthropology about a question of functionality or dysfunctionality because you can find that societies that you know have elements to them that you think you know on some objective basis maybe you know like treatment for women for instance is you know you might say is dysfunctional but of course that involves judgment and, mm -hmm. and I suppose you were quite non-judgmental weren't you in, uh, and, and uh, yeah. which, is, which is obviously good in terms of opening your eyes but you know this question should we be addressing this question of dysfunctionality or what is functional what is dysfunctional I think that's a really great question. And, you know, at one of the end of the spectrum, you have people who make very strong moral judgments about other societies and don't want to find out what drives them and basically fight them off and have a complete lack of curiosity. You know, Donald Trump was at one end of the spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum, you have people who say that everything is valid and fair and reasonable, and we shouldn't ever make any judgments about everything else and, and accept everyone's values as equal. Anthropology has... You know, anthropology started in the first category in the 19th century, 
when it was really a sort of uh, um, a discipline that upheld the empire and a lot of racism and it was essentially used as a tool to try and justify why white men ruled it. And then in the 20th century, it did a flip and it went towards the second category, which is often called cultural relativism, but not entirely because, you know, anthropology argues that you need to understand other people on their own terms, but that you don't necessarily need to embrace all their values in your own lives and the way you see it. So personally speaking, I sort of somewhere sort of towards the cultural relativism end of the spectrum, but not entirely because I think that to understand other people, you have to open your eyes and lip and to the idea that you might be missing things and be willing to listen to another point of view as humbly and openly as you can, because otherwise you don't understand people. And you need to recognize the need to actually try and be curious about others, because that's crucial. But it doesn't mean you don't necessarily need to toss all of your own values out of the window. You know, I actually think for what it's worth that, you know, it's not right to be stoning women to death if they've committed adultery or it's not right to be denying them the right to work and things like that that you know that's not those aren't values that i approve of but i think we need to be curious to find out you know how and why those values emerged and also most importantly to recognize that cultures change and they don't have fixed boundaries and borders i can't stress that strongly enough you know any one culture at any one time thinks the way it lives is not just natural and inevitable and right, but that it's permanent and it never is. We always change. Culture is more like a river than a box in that you have, it's constantly moving, it might be slow moving, but it's moving and changing and you have new streams coming in. And we should welcome that, particularly after a time when we've all been through enforced culture shock through a lockdown and another form of culture shock as we go back into real life. Well, just as well as the moral angle, I was thinking just there's another element, isn't there, into dysfunctionality in terms of, I suppose, a culture or tribe that has lost the ability to see or become very sort of narrow and inward looking and lacking diversity and so on. And I suppose some of your critiques of some of the, the tribes you look at, if we I'm using the tribe word, which obviously, but, but I think, you know, as long as you use it generically, everyone. But the worst suggestions, I thought that, you know, you suggested some tribes because they hadn't, you know, they couldn't really see outside or they, they didn't realise what was going on. That in that sense, maybe were dysfunctional. I think that certainly there is, I mean, by the way, the word tribe is a bit slippery because it has a very specific technical meaning within anthropology. It refers to particular political structure. So as some anthropologists get upset about using the word tribe, but I think what I, I think people know that's also a popular meaning as well, which means in our cultural group, our mob that works to a certain dynamic. I think that, you know, there is a real danger that people can't see the failures of their own patterns and structures, which is exactly why we need to have, you know, anthropology to actually realize, you know, where we're going wrong and also what we can learn from others. And, you know, just to show you, if you imagine the way that we've all experienced culture shock, recently i'll give you two examples in terms of going you know suddenly being forced to conduct half our work on zoom as opposed to in real life you know we've gone from the tribe if you like of real life office culture to a zoom tribe and we're now going back you know but through passage of time you know there's elements of that we want to keep elements we don't want to keep the elements we do want to keep you know for example there's some evidence showing that zoom meetings tend to be much more equal in terms of everyone having the same space on screen and you know, if everyone raises their hands on a Zoom meeting, women get more chance to talk than they do in real life because they don't get drowned out. That's a good thing to, tr to keep. A new cultural dynamic is worth trying to maintain. You know, things that aren't so good is the fact you can't bump into people quite so easily on a Zoom call as you can in real life. Or to take another example, you know, 18 months ago in New York where I live, it was inconceivable that people would wear masks on the street because that was a cultural phenomenon viewed by New Yorkers as kind of downright weird and Asian, and it was associated with stigma. New York happened to do very clever messaging right from the get-go around masks, unlike other parts of America, let alone the UK. They rebranded masks as a sign of strength and patriotism and personal responsibility. There's a lot of evidence from anthropology studies in Asia that during SARS, masks helped to cut transmission rates, not because they stopped their physical jump of movement of germs through the, the fabric but because they're a very powerful psychological prompt to people to, to change behavior and a cultural signal of adherence to collective responsibility and new york embraced that a thousand percent and so now masks are not only not seen as a sign of stigma or asia 
they're actually for a while they were seen as a sign of being anti-Trump and pro-liberal values because Mo yeah. Trump rided them. But they're also seen as be seen often as a sign of collective responsibility and respect for each other. And people today in New York quite often wear them when they don't have to, out of respect for others, because you know this culture has changed. And it's a respect for others saying, listen, even though I'm double jabbed, you may not know that I'm double jabbed. Other people here may not know this as well. We can't all tell that. So let's just put our masks anyway. I want to now just talk about a particular tribe that we are really interested in, which are economists. And I mean, it's interesting, you know, you talk about in other circumstances how people, you know, culture can change and there are ways through to find paths for change. Like I loved your example of Sierra Leone and dealing with the pandemic there and that they managed to adapt their uh, Rich. burial rituals to to meet their requirements, but with reducing risks. And I, I wonder, you know, and you say quite often that there are always, there are, you can find ways for adaptation. So I'm putting you the challenge, mainstream economists, I suppose, particularly as obviously one of their core beliefs is methodological individualism, which obviously is the sort of opposite end of the, uh, the scale from anthropology, looking at structures, tribes, et cetera, et cetera. Do you see any paths for mainstream economists to, I suppose, adapt and change? Or do you see them sort of I absolutely uh, circling do. the yes. wagons? Well, firstly, they have circled the wagons, and that's normal. You know, anthropologists circle the wagons whenever they're under pressure or attack. Journalists circle the wagons big time when they are under attack. And we saw that with Donald Trump and his attacks on the media. So the fact that economists circled the wagon after 2008 is not surprising. The fact they often circle the wagons now is not surprising. That's called human nature. I do see sign of change and reflection. After 2008, behavioral economics became a big thing. And people realized that actually incentives and psychology mattered in markets. And that's welcome. Didn't go as far as it should have done, but it's welcome. I would say today there's growing recognition that tech is changing how economics works, particularly given how much um, the industry relies on the exchange of data for services in what I call a barter trade that isn't easily measured by money. And there are, there are economists thinking about that increasingly now, which is good. And also economists, I think, are starting to realize that na narrow models of how inflation and labor markets work don't always capture how human and cultural dynamics shift and in fact i just was on a call very interestingly with this morning with people in the white house in america who are absolutely recognizing that labor market economics needs to take a much broader view of how people work and what is work and how does that actually de develop and operate so I do think there's, oh, and the environment is another classic example where people are realizing the need to take account of externalities, including things they can't easily price or measure and for which there are no obvious markets. So climate change has forced that debate onto the table very rapidly. So there's definitely change in the economics profession. And I salute all the economists who are trying to accelerate that. I, you know, one of the key messages of my book is that I'm not arguing that anthropology has all the answers to life at all, but I'm arguing that it should be combined and could be combined with economics or finance or big data. And that will create a much better type of analysis for everybody. It's one, one of the things I think you talk about, but, but I, you know, is I suppose the boundaries of tribes, what's allowable to do. And, and I think the behavioral economics, I think is a very interesting example because actually the behavioral economists who I, I would suggest who, who were accepted sort of also had to accept various things within mainstream mm -hmm. economics to be allowed in, if you like. A bit like, you know, women to be allowed into the workplace have to sort of behave a bit like men. And one of the key things is that as long as they stuck in uh, talking about irrationality and people being a bit stupid, that was fine because economists think people are stupid anyway. So that was that was quite easy. But what they weren't really allowed to do is try and think of a dist different system analysis of how the world works. Mm -hmm. So it, I suppose people would say that economists have sort of, they, they let things in, but they've set boundaries as to what's, what's sort of allowed. Yeah, you have to play within the system. It's, and I've had to do that in journalism. You know, I've had to, to, to get a voice. I had to play by journalism rules, which in some ways involved me making compromises, you know, compared to what I think is a way to do things in, in anthropology. 
that's just called some academic anthropologists would say that those compromises are not worth making. And I respect that completely. It's for the individual to choose, but this is how I've played it. Some people who want to go in and do behavioral economics might say, you know what, don't want to even try to be part of the economics profession by publishing in these journals and stuff. Again, it's a, it's a choice. I tend to operate with what I call a domino theory of communication and trying to change ideas. Basically, you know, if you imagine the, the domino game, you know, most people talk about this in relation to dominoes stacked up in rows and one topples over and there's a chain reaction. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the fact that a domino piece has two parts, two numbers, and that, you know, you try and match one number with someone else's number. So you have to basically buy into the system and use signaling devices that connect with what they expect already. But the other half of the domino is different and you can take somebody on somewhere else. So with journalism, good journalism recognizes you're not going to get anybody to read your article unless you tap into an issue they're interested in or a motif or stereotype they already know. But then you can say you think it's about X, but actually it's about Y. I wonder... One thing that's just recent, I suppose, debate, which seems to be a lot of the sort of heterodox economists say the biggest influence we've had recently in terms of challenging the mainstream is is in the, the space of money with mm. modern monetary theory. And particularly, I mean, what's major thing here with all the borrowing that happened by the government for COVID, it turns out that 95 percent of it came from the Bank of England. And so 95 percent is owed to the Bank of England, which is owned by the government. And you'd think, well, you can net that out, can't you? Uh, but it's really interesting that in spite of that fact getting out there, people don't mention it. I'm about to actually write a, a, a big piece on this. I mean, two things I'd say is one is that the nature of money is changing at the moment because of the rise of cyber and digital currencies. But two, that, you know, I think there's a tremendous amount of social silence around the issue of debt right now. And basically, you know, there is no capacity constraint around debt creation. David Graeber, an anthropologist, wrote a brilliant book called Debt the yeah. First 5,000 Years about this. But eventually, the debt numbers are getting bigger and bigger. You know, one of several things will have to happen. Either it gets essentially written off and there's a debt jubilee. And to a certain degree, that's one of the things that people are running away from talking about, but probably will happen in some form. Or you inflate your way out of debt, which is basically, you know, default by another means. Or you actually engage in, you know, I mean, I said the first one is active defaults or jubilees, you know, or you're going to have some kind of financial oppression and hope that eventually it will um, get rid of the debt pile. And that means keeping interest rates ultra low. Or you basically end up growing your way out of the problem, but that almost certainly won't happen. So there is a huge, great social silence at the very heart of our financial system today that's actually been increased as an issue as a result of COVID. But also a sort of understanding that money is debt and that and debt can be created, but it also can be destroyed without any ill effects. But people don't like, to, I mean, whenever someone on the BBC points out that most of the debt, COVID debt in Britain is actually owed to the bank, of, you know, it's an amazing moment and then it's all forgotten. And the government goes back to saying we've got to pay off this huge debt to ourselves. But, you know, you can't mention that. It's almost difficult for other people to mention it. It's a social silence. Yeah. Yeah. But I love, yeah, the looking for those silences. I think I will certainly take that. But I really appreciate and enjoyed your book because it dealt with so much of uh, how I think about it. And, and I think you point out that big hole in economics of ignoring social structures. Mm. Uh, that is probably, I think, the biggest hole there and i really hope your book will raise that uh, awareness to people to 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 try and fill that uh, that hole wonderful well thank you so much for your interest really appreciate it and i salute the fact you're bringing these social sciences into the world of financial and economic sciences as well so part of very much what i hope the conversation will develop into in the future so thank you brilliant well thanks very much for your time